So before we look particularly at this area, we're going to have a quick look at the, the general background of the plantation and of all the layers of people that actually arrived here. And we'll look first at the quotation from A.T.Q. Stewart, the historian, that really says it pretty well. The distinctive Ulster Scots culture, isolated from the mainstream of Catholic and Gaelic culture, would appear to have been created not by the specific and artificial plantation of the early 17th century, but by the continuous natural influx of Scottish settlers, both before and after that period. And when you look at the map there and you see how close the areas are, and then you start to look archaeologically at what happened, you can understand that the connection between Ulster and Scotland is very strong. Um, again, looking archaeologically, the first people that we see arrive, and the first that we know at the minute, there might be some we just haven't found yet, basically the Stone Age settlers, about 8,000, 7,000 BC or so, who came across um, looking for flint and different types of stone and all the sort of resources, because the seas and the rivers were easier for them to cross than the woods and the mountains. Um, long, long time after that, you get the influence that people mostly seem to think of, um, the, the Celts, the Celtic war bands, the small bands of people who came across around about 500 BC. You have the Viking raiders about the 1790s who rushed down through, um, cleared out basically the male population of the west of Scotland, um, rampaged through Ulster and settled further south. Then we have the, the Normans, the Anglo-Normans who actually came up from the south and have most influence around our coasts. Between 1200 and 1600, you have hundreds and hundreds of mercenaries, the Galaglass or the Red Shanks coming across, um, made Donegal, Antrim and into the interior areas as well and making a difference and moving back and forward as well, the whole period of time that we have here. And then by the 17th century plantation, you have the largest movement of the time in Europe of people coming across. But you see, this is just a continuation of what went before. Um, the push and pull factors that you'd hear about in a geography class um, are consistent all through time, whether we know what they actually are in the early periods of time, like you see in the map there, when you had Dalriada and unspecified kingdoms and, and people moving. So the push and pull factors would be what pushes somebody out of a, a country. It could be famine, it could be political reasons, it could be just a sense of adventure. And these go on whether we recognize what they are or not. Um, and in this area here, you see the general area that um, fed into Ulster in the 17th century plantation. But again, the same need to improve things for your family and to see what was out there. And this was started in this case by James I of Scotland, who now united the kingdoms of Scotland and England and wanted to create a united kingdom, not just under one flag, but under one king and under one tax system, which was fairly important to him. Um, the background in Antrim and Down, which had obviously seen the most amount of settlers and movement back and forward all over that period of time and before it. <clears throat> in Antrim in 1605, for example, you have Randall MacDonald, Roman Catholic Highland Scot family, um, who took over Dunless, didn't build it, but took it over and brought over a lot of Roman Catholic Scot settlers over a long period of time. But once James I came in and wanted Presbyterian settlers, then they adapted and they created the village around Dunluce and they brought over settlers, Catholic and Protestant, with names like Adair and they knew Barr, Cunningham, Dunbar, Dunlop, Kidd, Miller, Moore, lots more. And meanwhile in County Down, you have Hugh Montgomery and James Hamilton um, coming across, extending their estates, extending what land they had already and their areas of influence and bringing with them surnames like Aiken or Aiken, Armstrong, B.D. Crothers, Graham, McKittrick, Warnock, lots of others again, people who were connected to them, people who were tenants on their estates as well. And then after the flight of the Earls happened um, and the people were left with no leaders, the land automatically reverted to the Crown and James was happy to have it and he decided that west of the van in those marked counties then he was going to sort people out, put the right people in for the right jobs, get the place sorted, get it part of the proper United Kingdom. And in that period of time from, from James started until 1700, you have about 200,000 Scots coming across to Ulster, bringing their family names, their music, their beliefs, their stories, their heritage, um, their entire lifestyle with them. 
the people that he came over with and the main people who owned the land, um, there were several different types. There was the undertakers, who were the big landowners and land managers. Out of those, you had 59 of those who were Scots and 51 who were English. The servitors, there were only two Scots and 54 English of those because the servitors have been thanked for their military um, expertise, actually, in parts of Ireland, and there weren't too many Scots fighting with the English for that. You also have the deserving Irish, who were the previous landlords of some of the areas, um, who were given bits of land, not necessarily in the area they were used to. You have the church, who was going to benefit all the time in every way. And one of the interesting undertakers you have was actually the combined London companies, the reluctant landlords, who would move into County Coleraine and make it County London Dairy. And whenever we look at their lifestyle, you see the, the landlords of all types had to make the place secure for people. So they would have a barn, they would build their houses, they would have a manor house, and they would start an organised around the market economy and the towns that hadn't really been there before. Um, you had a different style of house coming in that would adapt to the, the place and time as necessitated. And you have the people that we're going to be talking about in detail coming in with their lifestyles and their need to protect themselves and their need to help their families flourish. Um, and as they came into County London, Derry and Tyrone, the settlers came into a lot of resources, but also a lot of problems. So there was trees and lots of trees. So there were, one of the problems was the woodland. Another was the wolves that inhabited the woodland. And the other was the wood cairn, the Ulster Gaelic outlaws who still hung around in the safety of the woods. And then there was the weather that was overall, it was part of the time that was called the Little Ice Age, and it wasn't a big help for anybody. It wasn't a good thing. Um, the dry drought summers and the, the cold, cold winters weren't helpful to anybody. So in the new county London Derry then, um, they had taken County Coleraine, they took the barony of Loch and Chalin from County Tyrone, and then they divided the whole area up and to the different companies, the bigger companies that were um, part of the, the London um, merchant class and the higher level of that. So on the left, you can see London Derry there divided up into the areas that um, the different companies took. And on the right, you have the areas around Strabane, around that area, that were actually part of the Abercorn estate. <clears throat> the Abercorn estate is very interesting because it was a major Catholic family that came in. Um, stayed Catholic strongly for a long time, brought Catholic settlers in, and then hedged the bets as time went on, and where whatever the necessity was. Um, there were it was a fast growing area because of the commercial situation that there was on the farmland and everything else. But the Scots didn't just come in in one time, they came in in different waves. So after the 1640s, after the 1650s, and strongly in the 1690s, after a bad famine in Scotland. Um, on this slide, you can see two maps. So we'll look at the one on the left hand side first that marks out the area of Straban that was basically the um, Abercorn estate, and then the other main Scottish area, um, Mount Joy, Dungannon area, that was held by the Stuarts, but there was other smaller um, landowners as well. Um, whenever you look at the map on the left, then you can see um, the percentages of Scots in the different areas. Um, and this area we've circled, that's the general Abercorn area. And this one up here is around Coleraine, and that stretched out area that was the area of the cloth workers. And um, actually brought over then by um, Robert McClellan. The surnames and, um, of the people in the different areas in this entire council area, in fact, were quite mixed. So you have the, the Ulster Gaelic surnames that had started from about the 10th, 11th centuries, like Boyle and Breslin, Devaney, Kelly. Um, you have Viking names like Macaulay, McHugh, McLaughlin. The Gallo Glass are mercenary names like Campbell, Gallifer, and McCallion. The Anglo Norman names like Cusick, Fleming, and Hussey, which might have come up from the south of the Anglo Normans or might have come via Scotland, um, where the Anglo Normans also were. You have the English names like Cooper, Hastings, Jackson, Middleton. Welsh surnames, and they don't get a mention too often Edwards, Jones, and Vaughan. And then the Scots, which whenever you look at them, overwhelm all the other um, surnames. There's Archibald, Armstrong, B.D., Crawford, Elliot, Hamilton, McClintock, McKinney, 
Ramsey, Stewart, lots of them. Um, as I said before, by 1700, there was 200,000 people that arrived in Ulster from Scotland. Same push and pull factors as we talked about in 7000 BC. And not all of them were Protestant, contrary to what people think. Um, some of the Scots names that are here before the plantation that we can find in the history books and in the record books around this general council area too, the Atkinson, Boyd, Buchanan, Campbell, Patterson, McLean, Munro, Stewart and Ray. And then coming into Londonderry, one of the first is Anderson. You have Bailey, Barnes, Carmichael, Cook, Crawford, Cunningham, Douglas, Houston, Inglis, Neyland, McConaughey, Moore, Thompson. In Tyrone, you have Bell, Dixon, Gordon, Graham, Hume, Lindsay, Maxwell, McFarland, Montgomery, Nesbitt, Patterson, Robertson, Wallace, and Whiteside. So you could good varieties all over the place. And of course, they all moved about because these people didn't come over as slaves, they came in as tenant farmers and they could move. From the Ordnance Survey memoirs, much later in the 1820s, 30s, we can see what people thought of the, the people who kept their strong um, Scots identity going as opposed to the, the Scots who melted into society. And they talked about the Ulster Scots farms and they had a, a superior neatness apparently. The Ulster Scots displayed less quickness and intelligence than the Irish but the Irish were inferior in honesty. So there's good balance going on there. Um, where there were stories of witches and fairy and mischief, these were all imported with the Scotch colony. And most people, even by 1820s, 30s, spoke English, but the Presbyterians retained the broad Scotch of their ancestors. And when we look at that broad Scotch then, what do we see? Well, the English obviously um, became the important language. It was the economic language, the language that was going to unite everybody. But with the numbers of the Scots coming in and bringing in the Lowland Scots, or otherwise known as Lallans, this was what was going to develop into the Ulster Scots. And when we look at that, when we look at Ulster Scots, um, and sometimes people say it's a dialect and not a language, but we're sort of forgetting the fact that linguists talk about the dialect continuum, and that's the chain of mutually intelligible languages linked by geographical steps. So a language can change, languages can connect in gray areas and there's such overlap. Um, so remembering the layers of the people, again, we'll go back to that because they all have left the remnants of words behind. You have the Saxons, the Vikings, the Normans, and all languages evolve and to survive. And although we haven't directly got the Saxon words here, we have the way they came over in different ways. So we look at the Lowland Scots then, um, we have the Ulster Scots Gaelic, which moved back and forward over a period of time. And we haven't got a date for the start of that because it's impossible to date. Um, we have um, Northumbrian Anglo-Saxon coming across from the continent, north of England, south of Scotland, moving back and forward to Ulster unofficially and then upwards to the north of Scotland as well. Um, we have the Vikings that we mentioned before, shooting right on through the Western Isles and down through Ulster. Um, all of them making a difference. The areas that we divide the language to in Ulster, and my colleague Matthew will be doing a bit more on the, the language with you in another talk, so I'll not stay too long on it, but we have the Western, um, the Central and the Southern, and the Central and Donegal around January, Colwain and in County Down, and they represent the Scots language evolving in different ways over different periods of time and having come from different areas in Scotland as well. So there's um, a big significance there in the different words that have survived and the words that haven't. Um, looking at a few of the words and phrases just to give you a taste of it again. We have scundered, which everybody knows, and I hope you're not getting scundered with me. Fed up on other words. Um, there's blittered, which can mean drunk or can just mean tired and exhausted. And then for those who like to enjoy themselves, there's the word crack, which is not Irish. It is in fact Ulster Scott. And you can argue with me on another day about that. Farming words, um, words survive if they're useful, if they continue to be used. If they're no longer any use, then they fade out and people forget about them and don't use them. But farming words were 
for centuries and centuries, they were the words that everybody used and virtually everybody lived on farms. There's shuck, for example, the ditch, the paling posts or the fence posts, the stain dike, the stone wall, um, the manure or refuse tip, which is called in different areas, the midden, the dunkel or the duckle, the shed uh, or the um, animal house with the byre or the shade, and then the beasts, which were usually the cows. So you'd have yin coo and twa kai. And place names are the same, um, and it's interesting to look around your own area and see what there is. Um, an awful lot of places where you wouldn't think there were any Scots settlers at all still have the burn, the little stream, the nour of the small hill, the bray, which would be the feed on the, the hillside, the lonan, a lane, um, a pathway, which would be a, a rodden or a pad and wouldn't be used so much for um, traffic as just for people. And then you get the calhame or the callum or whatever way it's said in different areas of the cold home, which sometimes means the grave, which is nice and pleasant and right. <laughs> but think about the place names in your own area. Think about what they're actually called and, and what their origins might be, and you might see more influence of the Scots there than you think. Um, Ulster Scots and Salts are pretty good. Um, we have the descriptions like Crabbit and Carnaptious and Sleekit and Thaveless, uh, you could be Thran and three other. Um, as for compliments, uh, not so much. We don't really do compliments. Other changes then that, that um, came um, with the Scots, Protestantism had been around for a long time, but it was now would eventually become established. Um, new farming practices, new crops were brought in, um, different types of ploughs were used, different ways we used to even pluck the geese. And the towns in the market economy were a fairly major thing. They were um, the establishment of, of connecting Ulster to the rest of um, the United Kingdom and making sure that there was going to be a commerce, that the ports were going to be used, the towns were going to start and spring up and not just religious centres, and that it was actually going to take off as part of a wider kingdom. So what history and heritage and language does the Ulster Scot give us? Well, a queer queen of things. Well, I hope that gives you some information about the Ulster Scots. Maybe gives you some interest in actually searching your own area and seeing what's going on there. And if you would like more details, please feel free to get in touch with us because we're on the best of places and we'll be happy to uh, join us on the